created by a woman by the name of Ruth Handler. Mm -hmm. She was one of the co-founders and former president of the of Mattel. Oh, interesting. Uh, Ruth Handler herself says here she's um, she's a, a character in the Barbie movie. Uh, oh, okay. Play and she's played by actress Rhea Perlman. Uh huh. Interesting. Since she's a Polish immigrant. How many of the folks Jewish here have immigrant. seen the movies? I've, I I've have seen one. I've seen Barbie, but not Oppenheimer yet. And I, I would, I'm the opposite. I saw Oppenheimer and haven't seen Barbie. Haven't seen one. <laughs> Well, David, you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. It's, uh, I've actually, I thought Josh might be coming. Um, yeah, I thought so too. Barbara and Claire, I didn't hear your answer or, um, um, is it Andre? Um, I didn't hear your answers on, here's Josh. Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear your answers on if you have seen the movies. I uh, no, I, ha I haven't seen um, neither one. Okay. Barbara? And Claire? I haven't seen the movies, but I've had... Uh, a lot of experience with people who were in the Manhattan Project, and I worked for someone who was at one time de designated as the father of the atomic bomb. So I have um, a lot of interest in it. Okay, that's so. I, I haven't seen it either. Either one of them. I'm not a movie person. Okay. It sounds like we're have an audience that's mostly not seen these movies. So that um, I will. I don't know if you guys care about spoilers, but I will try to avoid them. Um, and I am. If anyone is astute at all about history, it's hard to create a spoiler around Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah. And also the, the BBC did a very good dramatization many decades ago of the Oppenheimer story. So that's kind of a, should dig that back out again at some point. That, that was good, but I'll compare it with the film. I'd recommend everyone to see the Barbie film uh, just as a kind of, I think it's quite an interesting exercise in terms of taking something that's quite, there's a kind of there's an agenda there's a kind of feminine, there's multiple agendas there they're trying to make it as accessible to the mainstream as possible and i liked it because so much is preaching to the you know preaching to the choir to actually try and do something that reaches across to the to the mainstream as broadly as possible is quite interesting is this working yep how's that Is the slide showing up? It's loading. Hmm. What are you all seeing? It just says click to exit full screen. It looks like it hasn't loaded. Hmm. You might want to go back to the original one and shrink the side things if you can. 
Hi, Veronica. This appeared to be working great when I was doing my run through in the beginning. Have you seen the movies, Veronica? Um, I saw Barbie and I've really, really wanted to see Oppenheimer. I've been wanting to see it, but I haven't had the opportunity to see it yet. <clears throat> I've just watched the trailer a few times. And so I think I know what it's about, but I don't know the full emotional impact of watching it. All right. I'm giving this share screen another shot. Did it work this time? It, it's in its minimized version. Okay. How about now? Loading. Still says loading. Are you able to see it? Yeah, I've got a beautiful slideshow on my side, and I don't know why. Yeah, it just says, says loading on our side, too. Yeah, can I you, think we can go with that minimized version so we can read it, so it's OK. okay. Or you can open it in a different web browser if you want to try. Sorry about that, folks. I thought I had this already. You have multiple screens, David. It might be showing on the wrong screen. Or... But it's showing that, us Pat? his browser. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe switch it to what your screen, your full screen, not a particular program. That's another idea. Okay. Let's see. Hi, Daryl. Hey, how's it going? What's up, Good. Paul? Good to see you guys. I'm Good trying to, to get too. trying to get the um, presentation loading. Oh, always a hassle with technology. Hey, Steve, how was Devo? <laughs> Devo was fantastic. I have to say, it was great. They were they hadn't lost anything at all. It was like. <laughs> If you were seeing them back in the day, not that I did see them. Back Are you guys in the day. seeing anything? Minimized it, version again. I mean, okay. just the, you know, the side Hello. slides. There Perfect. So working? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry for that delay. I came half hour early to troubleshoot that, and it happened anyway. So mm. yeah. Um, I saw a posting about um, Barbenheimer on an integral group, and someone had remarked, like, oh, this is crazy. Like, these movies are so different, and they're coming out at the same time. And my take on that was, are they really? Are they really so different? And what's happening here? Um, I just had some folks read here. So why Barbenheimer? What, what is going on here? Um, Barbie is currently the um, top grossing movie of the year and has already moved up to the number 14 movie of all time. And Oppenheimer at the same time is now the top grossing movie that has never been the number one movie because Barbie has been the number one movie the entire time that... Um, Oppenheimer has been running. So Oppenheimer likely would have been a number one movie in about any other time. And the two of them together, very interestingly, have become the fourth highest, and that may have even moved up since now, uh, since I last updated those numbers. Um, the, the fourth highest revenue generating movie weekend um, in history 
the previous three were all based on single movies like Marvel movies or Star Wars. And this was the only one that had a combination of two movies uh, elevating it to that heights. So what is going on here? Um, delving back into the history, um, and I'm going to go linearly now through time. Uh, Robert Arpenheimer, as many of you know, uh, was a physicist who he was born in New York and in the 1920s did most of his education first at Harvard for his undergrad where he majored in chemistry and then um, went to Europe and studied further at Cambridge and eventually got his PhD in Germany. And while he was in Germany, it was when he really met a lot of the famous physicists of his time and began collaborating with them, became known for his talents in the theoretical aspects of physics and the math, not so much for his laboratory skills. Um, and then after he had his PhD, he did joint fellowships at the California Institute of Technology in Harvard, and then was eventually asked to join the Los Alamos Laboratory when the United States, um, under the direction of FDR, um, wanted to develop an atomic weapon before the Nazis did. And then the Trinity experiment in 1945 was the uh, ultimate first test of an atomic weapon that was successful, that Oppenheimer was the head of that. Um, but then after, after World War II, he really became active in wanting to curb um, nuclear pro proliferation and wanted there to be a multinational or international control and regulation of this technology. And his activities um, politically ultimately ended, him, ended up getting his uh, security clearance revoked in 1954 that was only restored later um, posthumously. And it's very interesting to me that right at the point where uh, Oppenheimer's story is concluding here is right when we get into when Barbie is released. So as mentioned in some of the pre-discussion, Ruth Handler was the president of the Mattel company for 30 years. And it has been documented that she made observations of her daughter inventing her own paper dolls of adults. At that time, most dolls were like infant, infant dolls. And there's a nice parody of this at the very beginning of, of the Barbie movie as well. That's in one of the trailers. So I hope that's not too big of a spoiler. Um, so she thought there may be an issue for a new kind of doll. And then post-World War II, she was traveling in Germany, and there actually was a doll that was made for adult men um, called the Lily doll. And when Ruth Handler saw this, she um, brought it back to the United States and redesigned it as Barbie for girls and released it in 1959, and it sold... Um, over 350,000 the first year. Um, so it was very popular. Um, so she was, in, at least at some level, correct in her sense that there was a demand or a niche there. Um, but as you all know, that there, there has been criticisms about um, Barbie and what that means for feminism and uh, feminine imagery and roles of women and the movie deals with those so I will not go into that right now um, and so what are the potential common themes then between these two movies what what is going on here it's the same era of time um, and from a spiral perspective, I'm seeing one interpretation is that 
in both situations, you have some goals that have maybe some blue values, nationalistic um, conformity, um, using orange methods, uh, science, marketing, to achieve those goals. And as a result, you have uh, emergence of a green critique of this product. And I think in some sense, that interpretation could be applied to both situations. Um, so then that's the history. And as time moves forward, these movies then um, were released this year. Originally, uh, Christopher Nolan was going to release Oppenheimer on July 21st, but he did have a backstory a history with Warner Brothers. And uh, without getting too much into the details, Warner Brothers then decided to release their movie on the same day as Christopher Nolan. Um, and to what level that was personal, um, I'm not sure. Um, and what the intent was, I'm not sure either. But the result was that instead of being in competition, there seemed to be a synergy there. Um, and it created a situation where some people who may have been more likely to just see one of the movies ended up seeing both of them. Um, so I looked into some of the reviews of these movies. There seemed to be a lot more out there, a lot more controversy about Barbie in the current uh, um, uh, ethos. Um, and I thought it was interesting that both, um, both conservative and progressive uh, perspectives did not like this movie. And uh, for different reasons, and what, what I kind of got out of that is that there's a celebration of Barbie at the same time there's a playful deconstruction of Barbie. And if someone wanted that movie to be one or the other, they, they didn't get it. They, they had to deal with both. And... Um, Yeah, so if someone wanted it to be, you know, just this is a celebration of Barbie, a Barbie movie, they probably didn't like the deconstruction part. And if somebody wanted it to be a pure deconstruction of Barbie, probably didn't like the fact that it's still celebrating Barbie. Um, and I, I pulled my children who are of the uh, Gen Z um, background. Um, they, my daughter has not seen Oppenheimer, but she went to Barbie and I asked her what, what she thought the, the point of Barbie or what the take home message of Barbie was. Um, from her perspective, she said that it's not always good to just look at the positive things, but sometimes you do have to deal with the negative of life to be able to um, persevere and move forward. Um, when I asked my son about who I actually saw both movies uh, with him, his perspective was that these are the first like really popular movies since the pandemic. And they both in some sense deal with something that's catastrophic. So he thinks that people are trying to cope with uh, what they've been through. Um, and I thought this map was interesting. This is the United States of America and showing which movie was trending more than the other on the internet in different states. And, and this was around the time that the movie came out, like the week leading up to the movies coming out. So um, most uh, obvious observations there are, there does seem to be a bit of a red state, blue state, um, association and Barbie trending heavy in the Southeast. Um, and then 
there seems to be a more of a blue state preference with Oppenheimer, with the most intense being New Mexico, which is understandable because that's where Los Alamos is and where the Trinity experiment uh, occurred. So I asked myself, you know, is there anything deeper here? Are these just, you know, two movies? Um, it's been 78 years since the Trinity experiment in 1945, and it's been 64 years since Barbie was released. So we're reaching a point where there's more people alive after these events than before, or who were more people alive who were born after these events than before. And if and I was thinking about like, well, some people would say that the Cold War ended when the Berlin Wall came down in 1934, or in, in, 19, in 1989, which was 34 years ago. And we are so now further away in time from that event than that event was from these other events. And with that time passing, I'm just, uh, is there something where there's a need to go back to this time period and reevaluate it and figure out what things have we carried with us from this time? What things were we told when we were born about the world, about reality, that we need to go back and revisit and say, how much of this is still true? How many of these ideas are still useful? Um, is there some things here that need to be carried on and some others that need to be discarded? And so I wanted to then keep this brief and give some time for discussion. And I thought maybe we could start out first is if anyone has some uh, ideas that they want to share uh, to do raising the hand first and go around and have everyone have a turn to share some thoughts or ideas. And then after everyone's had a couple of minutes to share their initial thoughts, then we can just open it up to a free for all. So if anyone has something they wanna share right now, please use the hand raising tool. God, or uh, Steve. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, David. I, I, I mean, the, 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 I haven't seen the Oppenheimer, unfortunately, and it's, it's a shame no one's seen both, because I'm sure that'd be quite an interesting perspective, but I've seen the Barbie. And I, when I first heard it was advertised, I thought, oh God, that sounds terrible. <laughs> it sounded like it was going to be all the things that I would kind of, you know, try and avoid like the plague. Um, but then I heard some good reviews from people I trust. And so I went to see it with my wife. And we both loved it. We thought it was fantastic. Uh, and, you know, it's not a serious film in the sense of it's not an art house film. It's not a philosophical movie in the kind of classical, you know, way that people who love movies or whatever might think of. It's definitely targeting the mainstream, in that sense. It's not trying to be any kind of elitist movie, but it definitely packs a punch in terms of what it's trying to say about feminism or the state of the world and various other things. It's not necessarily completely coherent in its uh, in the way it delivers it, but it's but it's packing a punch. And I came out of it feeling it's probably going to be almost an epoch defining movie because it's it's really trying to get these fairly hardcore messages over to as broad an audience as possible. And and I think the fact that you can see it as that's its tactic is that all of the kind of heavy content, if you like, is completely omitted in the trailers <laughs> so they they clearly wanted to pull in as many people from the trailers as they could um and then just give them the experience so and so i thought that was kind of fantastic and you know the, the screening i saw everyone loved it there was kind of like a cheer at the end and uh you know so it was well received but my, my sister lives in a in a much more working class area um quite you know probably quite conservative in a way and people came out there saying that's the worst movie I've ever seen. <laughs> so, <laughs> quite... <laughs> but you know, for me, the fact that the woke and the anti woke both hated it, I think, is a, is a good sign. Anyway, thanks, <laughs> David. Why don't you stop the share view? What did you say, Paul? Say, why don't you stop the share view? Sure, that's a good point. 
<clears throat> Veronica, go ahead. All right. So like Steve, I saw Barbie, but I didn't see Oppenheimer. So, but I, nonetheless, I think that the idea that somebody would make an impactful film about one of the most important uh, topics of, of our day and for the last few decades, I mean, we, we really don't talk about the destructive power of, of nuclear weapons hardly ever nowadays. It's like the Cold War is over, but the weapons still persist. They're still there. And I don't think we fully grappled with that reality. So it's kind of an interesting contrast between Barbie, which is like this plastic, perfect reality, and then the the opposite reality of the possible destruction of of our planet by our own technology. So, I mean, thinking about the concept of metamodernism and deconstructivism, and in a way how we can have these multiple perspectives that are almost completely opposite. I think in that way, Barbie and Oppenheimer play off of each other really well because they show us both the, the possibility of, of play and playfulness and possibility that, that Barbie shows us as a evolutionary step in understanding ourselves or at least women understanding themselves as, as as humans with agency, you know, or at least introducing little girls to that concept. Now we might have outgrown that concept a little bit, but it was important in its in its day. And um, and at the same time, we're we're playing around with with these technologies with like, hugely destructive consequences. So, and it seems like we're still doing that delicate balance of life and death all the time. I mean, that's. That's what, I mean, that's what life is about in general, but it just seems that, that as time goes on, the stakes get higher in terms of, it's sort of like, you know, this whole discussion we've had with AI, where there's so much potential for creativity and and development at the same time, at the, there's also a contrasting potential, all kinds of, of harm. Um, so in that way, I, I think that these two themes play off of each other nicely. Because I, I have read some Barbie reviews, uh, not too many, but I, I I was kind of not taken aback, but I, I watched a TikTok by a, a Latin American influencer, a woman, a young woman, uh, who has a lot of followers. I don't know who she is. I, I don't know why she showed up on my feed. But she had the take, I guess she comes from a conservative background, that Barbie is trying to cancel traditional values, which I'm sure many of you have heard. And her proof, well, she had a few things, but one of her main points about Barbie is that the one Barbie in the movie that was pregnant, there was a pregnant Barbie who I guess... Mattel at some point, I guess she really did exist. Mattel canceled the, the pregnant Barbie doll. And so she was saying that that is proving that that's a cancellation of traditional homemaking values. Um, so it's sort of like, we don't want a pregnant Barbie. And then she was talking about the disappearing family values and all that sort of thing. So I think that Barbie in a way reflects whatever fears and hopes we have, depending on again what your meme, what your meme focus is, uh, is what you're going to see and take out of it. So anyway, that's about it. Yeah, yeah you want to go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to uh, compliment David on the great uh, opening presentation. I just thought it was very on point and succinct. That's all. Thanks, Joe. Mm -hmm. Gosh, go ahead. I'm, I'm in a pivotal moment in my omelet here. You're going to have to give me a minute. <laughs> 
That's <laughs> good. Uh, I I wake up to the set to the salon making coffee. So usually I'm just not available for the first twenty minutes. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So yeah, I haven't seen either film. I may if it goes to streaming, but I'm gonna put in the chat a YouTube video I did see about Barbie from one of my favorite YouTube creators. Her name is Chew on Head. She's a, uh, how to explain her. I would say she started about 10 years ago as orange, healthy, healthy orange, kind of anti-woke, like early on anti-woke. And then she's sort of evolved into a healthy early green where she's both very open to liberal values, but then is still calling out the illiberal left so her video about barbie basically says how similar to what veronica said that the film seems to be a rorschach test for people there are people like ben shapiro a conservative commenter who you know they have to come up with content so i think they're just half entertainment anyway but he's like oh look at the things in here that are so woke and then there are people and including she points out some stuff. Well, there's actually some stuff that that is fairly critical of elements of feminism. I don't know what happens in the film. My guess is that the film just tried to do. I'm sure they had an agenda, of course. Right. And there are certain things you need to say and not say. But it seems like they might have just gone for where the plot was the most fun. And when you do that in art, that's when you get the best art. You end up critiquing in a sense, both sides. Like you just, like in jokes, comedy, you go for the funny. It doesn't matter what the message behind it. It's like, all right, this is gonna shit on my favorite thing, but this is just where the joke is leading. You gotta do that for the art. So maybe that's what Barbie did. And that's why people who are very rigid in their ideology don't like it because it's not a pure reflection of what their ideology is. So yeah, that's all I have to say about that. And thanks for the presentation. I thought that was well put. Thanks. Um, I guess I had a number of, again, Dave, I want to thank you for the presentation. It, it was very succinct, but you brought out some really interesting points that, that uh, made me think about stuff that I hadn't previously. Um, as I had said, I did, my wife and I did go see Oppenheimer and we haven't seen Barbie yet. Um, I'm probably won't go to the theater cause it's almost gone from the theater, but I'm sure when it comes out in a, either a pay-per-view or whatever, we'll probably watch it. I maybe um, need to, uh, double check, but I was looking last night, I was preparing and I think there's still number two and number three. Really? Well, I know that there's still, you know, there's a, it's Barbie is showing at a, one of the local theaters. I do know that. Um, I guess a couple of things that really stood out to me. Um, it, you know, one of them was in a sense, they were speaking to two different realities. Um, Oppenheimer really spoke to a very, a very objective set of realities. Uh, you know, the the World War II was, was going on. Uh, there was a definite um, threat from uh, Germany. If they, if they developed the bomb first, there was some incredibly serious objective consequences that would come out of that. And, um, and then they, but they, the, the movie also did show that at least Oppenheimer kind of foresaw how how the imperatives of the reality at the time were and would change when when the when in the future and Oppenheimer did anticipate that. Um, and the other the other thing, and I hadn't really thought about this before, but um, and the, and that again the conflict of of um oppenheimer really was a set of very very blue values 
Um, Barbie, Barbie is a, it, it, it addresses a subjective reality. I mean, there is, there's, you know, there is no real Barbie person in the world. <laughs> you know, there are Barbie dolls, but all of the stuff that has come out of that is totally um, subjective and culturally context, contexted. And it was really, it was really driven by the orange values. Um, I mean, yes, it has, it's, it's now being interpreted in terms of, you know, Barbie subjected the older, bluer traditional values. Um, but again, even that, what's, you know, a traditional value is a subjective value. I mean, that's just, that's just reality. It's, you know, subjectivity is contexted by um, what the person believes and, and this is what the society believes. Um, you know, I thought that I really appreciated the part about Oppenheimer that I did appreciate was that they did, they did not shy away from either of the, the two, the two, re, the two objective realities. One that the fact that, you know, there was, there was real threat to, uh, to the future, to the world at the time from uh, Nazi Germany, and if they had, if they had developed the bomb first, um, there could have been, you know, the whole, the world would have had a different future than it did, ultimately did. But it didn't shy away from the fact that that, once that genie was let out of the bottle, even though there was a need to let that genie out of the bottle, you can't put it back in, and that, you know addressing that very serious near-term issue that existed in during World War II unleashed consequences that we still don't know how to deal with. And it makes me wonder what, you know, what, what's the future evolution of the Barbie aspect of it? How will, how will a subjective nature of Barbie evolve, um, particularly as you said, it did awaken that Green V meme. Well, both of them, both movies did, but particularly the Barbie did. That's all I've got. Well, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll add something, you know. With what from I haven't seen Barbie. I want to see it um, because uh, both my uh, my uh, significant other and her daughter are quite uh, engaged with its uh, with interest in it. Now we both were sick in the last two weeks, so we haven't been able to get out. I did. We did go see Oppenheimer. And I really enjoyed the movie. Um, so, you know, I think about it. What shows up for me, I'll just just sort of give a stream of consciousness, is that, you know, when I was a kid in the 60s, you know, I had G.I. Joe dolls, you know, and, and uh -huh. the little girl down the street uh, whose brother I played with, uh, who also had G.I. Joe, she had Barbie dolls. So we'd all play together and we'd play house and everything else. So I think for me, Barbie while it may have been something you know philosophically that was beyond blue i kind of think in my experience as a kid thinking about it how basically blue as i reflect now on it it was you know we would play house you know gi joe would come home from working and yada yada and we do you know for that year and a half two years of my life it was you know it was splendid you know uh and i would say my personal experience with Barbie and G.I. Joe was a very blue, you know, military outfits. Uh, just basically, when I look back on it, it was a very meaningful period of time for me. Fast forward to the present, uh, and it's kind of like, you know, um, and I, I think it was Ken Wilber who did a treatment many years ago in one of his books where he talked about how you look back on the past and you it's whether it's right or wrong, people tend to want to 
put a filter on the past and judge the past as if it was the present and the the contextual reality just was not you know the same and so what we now know and think uh and act upon aren't necessarily appropriate in the context of when something evolved and I, I say all of that that word salad to sort of suggest that judging a phenomenon like a toy like Barbie uh, and putting meaning on it of all the various value systems that one could, I think a few people just said it correctly that, you know, um, you know, they're putting upon Barbie, whatever it is, their point of view is woke, unwoke, whatever it is, they are putting that on this, <laughs> this toy. And that's just fascinating. It's very uh, surface level memes, but even if it's not the deeper memes, those service level memes have as much impact as uh, in some instances as some deeper level memes because they put it right upon that little toy. I, I thoroughly enjoyed Oppenheimer and I'm planning on seeing Barbie for lots of different reasons, particularly this, this salon session. Barbara, why don't you go ahead? Um before we started recording, uh, we were talking about the difference between Barbie and American Girl dolls. Um, and uh, for, and I, I have not, if there is a child or with my kids, uh, been any in the least bit interested in either. But um, th those who had worked with American Girl, I, let, let's and GI Joe also. Let, let's. Uh, Let's bring that forward in, into the discussion while we're recording. Well, I guess my one, thanks for that, Bar uh, Barbara. It's, and this thought just came to me. It, it, it is interesting how, I mean, again, Barbie, G.I. Joe, um, American girls, whatever. They're they're all social construct. They, they all tell stories that have social constructs to them, and it's interesting the relationship between those and the and the very objective physical nature of them. I mean, and I, it would be interesting. You know, I'm I'm trying to think. You know, what is the relationship between that? You know, what. What's the difference between holding a value and creating a doll that holds a value? Um, you know, there's a certain set of values that about masculinity that G.I. Joe um, depicts. Um, you know, there, a pacifistic G.I. Joe is an oxymoron, you know, so so you, there's a there is a there's a, a particular value system that's projected by a by gi joe that's projected by barbie that's projected by <clears throat> american girls and there's probably other examples out there i'm not um you know pro probably beanie babies project some kind of value um but it's interesting that when you objectify and by objectify i mean when you actually create a a thing when you create a doll when you create a story around a doll and print books about it and and you know create advertising campaigns you know the whole minor when you begin to solidify that very subjective thing that's represented by the value system it's interesting how the dynamic changes and what does that say about um you know, about how life conditions shape things in in more subtle ways than, than we think about. So, can I ask a question? Is it possible? I haven't seen Barbie and I was wondering if, I mean, um, and I think David, I think you said you saw Oppenheimer. Did you see them both? Did you? You know, my story is that my son and I both had a Thursday off 
and we went and saw both of them the same day oh, cool. at the same place that's good. That's good. we had like lunch in between okay. it was it was totally serendipitous we were just kind of like you know what let's just do this that's good that's good yeah no I, you know i wanted to uh you know i'm i'm curious I'm, i think i'll probably go see barbie today or tomorrow i would prefer to go see it with my girlfriend but it, I'm so interested in it. I may just go without her, but but then she would probably trip. But um, uh, but I'm just curious. Uh, could you give a, a little overview? And maybe you did it in the presentation. I just don't recall because I was still kind of waking up. Without giving a full on spoiler, could you talk a little bit about the Barbie? I'm just really curious as to, and and, and you know, uh, the I just don't get what the, I guess the the controversy I get is that half of the movie was about um you know women's rights or something like that you know basically mm -hmm. trying to make it to date uh and then the how they dealt with the other half of it was I, i'm not sure what it was but it seemed to have a a dichotomy a dual message of some type that's what i've heard yeah i i think um there's kind of both going on at the same time and i'll i'll kind of give just sort of a brief setting and if someone thinks this might be a spoiler you can put mute on now um but basically it starts off where there's barbie land and it's this fantasy world where um sexism doesn't exist and all the barbies are happy and they're very individualistic all succeeding and whatever the individual things is that they do and then this world kind of gets punctured at a point there's a crisis and that leads Barbie having to go into the real world. And um, Barbie goes into the real world and takes Ken with her. And they both have different reactions to the real, real world. And this, some of the consequences then end up with the Kens taking over Barbie world. Um, fascinating okay that's and <laughs> along the whole way then i my interpretation is that there's this playful simultaneous celebration of barbie and having good memories of barbie for you know adults that played with barbie um thinking fondly about those moments and then at the same time deconstructing the sort of negative aspects of Barbie <laughs> um, and kind of mocking Barbie while celebrating Barbie. Wow. That is, and that is if anyone else has seen it and disagrees with that, please that is, uh, share. Well, the only thing I was going to say is that when you mentioned that there was no sexism in Barbie land, there wasn't in the kind of culture war we might have here in human world, but, you know, sort of like Ken was the underdog because well, all the men's were called Ken's. They, 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 and all the all the women were called Barbie, except for what was the name of that dude? Alan. That, I think it's Alan. Alan. Um, so, so, yeah. So the so Ken played a secondary role in Barbie Land, but everybody was just happy, fine with it because it's the only reality they knew. So when they go to the real world, and Barbie sees that men are the ones that are their players and that hold the power, she doesn't quite get it. And so, but the Ken is inspired. He's like, wow, in this world, the men are the ones that are on top. Cool. Wow. And so he goes back to Barbie land before Barbie gets back there. He gets a lead on her and he changes everything. And by the time Barbie gets back to Barbie land, all the men, all the, all the Kens have taken over. And uh, so basically it turns the world, it turns the Barbie world upside down. So it's sort of like, it, it's kind of making us see what it would be like if the gender roles were in reverse in a fantasy doll land and what would happen if things were flipped all of a sudden. And then by the end of the film, it's kind of playing with trying to neutralize those roles or trying to have them Play, just having having them be a, a more healthy. You, you broke you broke up a little bit, Veronica. Could you repeat? Between the two genders, yeah. which is I think in a way what we're doing now. Uh, 
so yeah, by by the end of the film, by by the end of the film, the, basically the it was about not only the genders kind of equalizing and coming to terms with each other, nobody being above anybody else, but also about finding your own inner balance without relying on another person. I'm probably giving a lot away right now. But for, for me, Barbie was really, uh, because in the film, Ken is actually really, he's smitten by Barbie and his whole world is Barbie. And by the end of the film, it's not a happy ending where they get married and have whatever <laughs> mini Ken and mini Barbie dolls. But it's sort of like, by the end, it's Barbie telling Ken that they each have to find their own sense of self and not rely on each other, which I think is a very postmodern or metamodern kind of concept mm -hmm. that we're going even beyond the concepts of gender and how men and women should relate to each other, but how should we relate to ourselves? Hmm. But I, there was a part of that, uh, Veronica, that I still felt like like it's not quite there it's like still very hyper individualistic in the end it's like okay ken this isn't working out but you're on your own to figure it out good luck <laughs> so, so yeah you know, it's a real this, interplay between uh be, oh go ahead barb you know this feels to me the old um religious idea of of women uh at using their sexual power to control monster men right so if, if you if you think about that in barbie land right uh barbie's controlling ken uh as a sex as, as her with her as a sex object right and and he's obsessed with her and and i don't know what this means but it just strikes me that that there's that underlying it, it's not just um uh, women under the control of men it's it's men being terrified that that women will will use sex to control them right back and i don't know where that goes but just it it, it just as we were discussing you know the kind of the the can is obsessed with barbie right they uh, don't have private parts though i just want to clarify that well yeah right <laughs> <laughs> This is all PG, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, it's a really interesting point because uh, so my, as I heard everyone share about this, my thought went to, okay, so what's happening mimetically? Is it that blue emerged into orange and, and, and Barbie, it, when they left, let me just, uh, another stream of consciousness, as they left the fantasy land toy world and went into the real world, was that more or less a purple kind of a thing evolving or a blue kind of a thing evolving to a higher level complex uh, way of, of thinking and being? And then in that, in that introduction into the real world where, where the orange mean sort of was the, 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 the power of the day where Ken came into his thing. Uh, I just think of the, as I heard you guys explain it, you know, when they ended up in, reflecting on well look let's just be ourselves and not you know buy into these gender stereotypes whatever so the to me it sounded like it emerged into a green kind of a thing so it's, so it's interesting to think about it with the lens of spiral to see what was all going on because one could argue that in the fantasy land in barbie land whatever it's called that's kind of really more of a purple existence in the real in in, in, in the clinical sense so to speak but but uh the the emergence of Barbie and Oppenheimer, for that matter, they both came about in a period of time uh, in the United States, anyway, where blue was pretty dominant. You know, there was a very strong traditional set of values in play as both these realities emerged the toy and its phenomenon, and the experiment with the physicist and them creating the bomb. It's just interesting, you know. Yeah. Just, just to sort of follow on maybe from both those comments, I think I think one of the interesting thing is it, the film unpacks a bit the complexity of the doll. So in the Barbie world, Ken doesn't really ever do anything. So in the film, he says, "I just do beach. That's that's all I do." <laughs> so it touches a bit on toxic 
masculinity there as well in terms of what the hell is the role of of Ken without without Barbie? He's just this hanger on for Barbie, and it, so even if it's emerged in a kind of blue epoch, the, the Barbie world per se doesn't really have a role for Ken other than just to be this kind of like sidekick, you know, sort of good looking, kind of gay looking, really. And they they make a joke on that. <laughs> Young, um, but you know, sidekick for Barbie, really, and that the Barbies, even though they're styled in a kind of um, what would have been recognizable as attractive from the kind of blue theme at the time, they do all the roles. The Barbies have all the jobs basically, and the Ken just does beach. So there's this, and that, that's part of the way he's he's lost. That he's like, I don't really know what the hell I'm here for. <laughs> so that there's this, that they're kind of questioning that. that, that if if you just followed the gender script to some extent, whatever it was, even in this weird Barbie world, you you've never really examined your purpose. You've just kind of accepted the script you're given, and you've never really kind of d- dug down to say, well, what am I, what am I on this planet for? What what as a human being? Why am I here? What you know? That you're just kind of going along, um, yeah. And there's there's a great scene in in one of the um, trailers, so I'm not giving a big spoiler here, but they're having a big girls night out. It's a big dance scene and they're all having a great time. And then in the middle of it, one of them says, do any of you guys have intrusive thoughts about death? <laughs> and the whole thing stops because that kind of cracks the, the dream in a way. And that's the beginning of the adventure. So, yeah. It was interesting because when you look at Oppenheimer and you saw there was a couple of scenes where uh, the you know they moved the whole of the families and you could see very much the traditional values coming out when various wives sort of played certain roles uh in the in the los alamos environment there you know and i just thought it was interesting how um how, how they dealt with that so i you know i i guess we've been talking about barbie a lot but i'm curious as to how everybody considers uh the film oppenheimer and its impact you know my my sense is that it, uh, I think it was Veronica who said, you know, we don't, we seem to have moved on, and no one actually recognizes how seriously, uh, how serious the threat still is of of nuclear conflict. You know, especially illustrated by the recent war, the go- the one that's going on between uh, Russia and Ukraine. I mean, where they openly talk about, well, we might have to use some limited number of nukes, is just amazing to me. You know, that uh, that the world has sort of I agree with with the comment that Veronica made. We sort of sort of moved on. It's not as not considered as big a threat as it once was, uh, which is fascinating in and of itself. You know, so I don't know is that a postmodern manifestation? Is the problem still, you know, back in the you know in the another area? I mean, would we qualify the problem of nuclear proliferation the same today as we did 25, 30 years ago? I don't know. You know, I, I agree with Veronica's comment that people seem to go, eh, you know, it's not much to it these days. Until another nuclear accident or an actual nuclear attack happens, then people will run around with their hair on fire all of a sudden, having kind of logged themselves into a respite for the last 20 years or so. So, Josh, really- you've had your hand up for a while, I think, or is that from before? No, yeah, but people were commenting on the thing. But if anyone who hasn't spoken yet wants to jump ahead of me, I'm fine with that. I will allot five seconds for you to step up. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, does Kubo want to say something? That was the idea. It's been very quiet. Um, not yet. Not yet? I wanted to say something. Okay, Claire. I, go ahead, Claire. I think there's a lot more fear now about uh, nuclear weapons because they're not really sure who's in power in Russia at the moment. You know, there have been a lot of um, subversion, and no one really even knows who's alive or dead and who would control. Uh, the largest cache of nuclear weapons that exist. So I think it's not really so casual at all when I read about military news. I think they're very, very concerned about who would be in control of those arsenals. And then going back to the 
more innocent times of um, the beginning of the Manhattan Project, I happened to have worked for a guy called Alexander Sachs, who became Sir Alexander Sachs. And Einstein was too shy. I mean, it, it was kind of anti-macho. He was too shy to approach President Roosevelt with the idea of how this uh, energy could be used. And uh, Dr. Um, Alexander Sachs, who was an economist, had to step in and write a letter to FDR. So it started strange. Alexander Sachs at that time had the title of the father of the uh, atomic bomb. And there was this office where all these letters from all the various physicists were strewn around casually. I mean, you would step on them on the floor. That was the kind of office that I worked in. Wow. That I was probably good at disorganized. But look, with all this brilliance around it, and it wasn't such a, um, you know, one one dimensional thing. And it was considered, you know, a date, uh, at that point, a great contribution. But it was started with the utmost modesty by Einstein, who was too shy to set forth. So I. It's just an interesting contrast to me. That's very cool. Yeah, Claire was a part of things back then in that regard. That's Ooh. that's really interesting. So let's see, I have three points to make. And the fact that I haven't seen either movie is not going to stop me from making these points. So the first one is, I'm curious if in Barbie they commented at all on idealized body forms for for men too you know did that come up because i think it's interesting you know obviously you don't necessarily want to have and kids probably don't want a very unhealthy looking body whatever um but you know for instance i'm i'm tall lanky but very fit sh shaved head i i don't see my representation anywhere you know so like what's going on with that but gosh yeah. You can you can watch. I posted a link to the Ken song. Okay. You can watch the video and and make your opinion about Ken's prosthetic six pack. Okay. <laughs> good. Good to know. Well, that's that's just that's yeah. So they may have addressed it one way or another. That's that's interesting. Uh, the second point I had is that this is kind of a meta thing, and this is rumor, but there's a lot of evidence for it that the actress who played Barbie got a bunch of plastic surgery to play the part, which mm. that just kind of is like, oh shit. So the whole thing is, oh, these, these fake dolls are giving little girls ideas of certain things. I don't, I don't know if it is or not, but that was a real thing. If that's true, she doctored her face in order to be able to play this plastic doll, which I don't know. There's something almost sad about that. It's almost like, do we bear the responsibility of that the way we do with all the CTE with football players? You know, it's like there are gladiators and, and she's like, I'll cut my face up just to be on the screen. And the last point is actually a question. Did the Oppenheimer film bring up, in a sense, both sides about dropping the bomb on Japan? Because I've long been an anti-war i'm still an anti-war guy that was unconscionable there were other options even recently the other day i was with an organization anti-war thing we're making those peace cranes to commemorate the the dropping of the bomb and obviously it was it was a terrible thing but the more i've looked into and mostly not read but actually just watched films so who knows documentaries about the war in the pacific it was that the Japanese were maybe so blue that they were not going to give up, that they were going to fight to the last man, woman, and child. And that in a sense, the bomb prevented what would have been potentially carnage of an entire nation. I don't know. Was that brought up at all? Um, I, yes, it, yes, it was. People, yeah. I mean, mute if you don't, if you haven't seen the movie and you think this might be a spoiler, but 
about two thirds, three quarters away through the movie, there's this great scene where Oppenheimer goes to the Oval Office to meet Harry Truman, played by Gary Oldman, who I didn't even recognize him until after the movie. And this this uh, interaction between Oppenheimer and Truman does not go well. And there's a lot of tension over who should have, who has more responsibility weighing on their conscience for the bomb being used. That was a good scene. Yeah. Yeah, they they didn't go into massive detail, uh, but they but but it was addressed. You know, and I have to admit, I'm somewhat of a, I mean, I'm not somewhat. Of, I am a history geek, and um, the war in the Pacific, the war with Japan, is one of the parts of history that I've probably studied too much. Huh. But what you said was was a it was the reality that the world was dealing with at that time. I mean, there was, um, you know, during the island hopping campaign in World War II, it was just clearly evident that, you know, the Jap Japanese would fight to the last person. I mean, and and their their goal was, even if they knew they were gonna die, it was kill as many Americans as you could. Um, there was the reality of that, you know, particularly in China, the Japanese army was incredibly brutal. Um, and and the the you know again nobody no, nobody knows at the time nobody knew anything. I mean nobody nobody knew how many people would die in either the bombs, uh, and nobody knew how many people would die if the homeland had to be invaded. <clears throat> But there were there were reasonable estimates that were saying that there would be anywhere f that in all likelihood a, a million Americans would die taking the home taking the Japanese homeland, and that as many as seven or eight million or more Japanese would die, and then there was the reality that if it if it really played out, the war would really go on for years because the Japanese would. <laughs> you know, would go into a resistance mode and you, and you go into Northern Japan and it's mountainous and it could take years to root that out. And that was the reality they were dealing with. Um, so it did bring, it did bring that out. And, and the truth is um, that's oftentimes how the narrative, that is forgotten in a lot of the narratives around you know, should the bomb have been dropped? Well, <clears throat> and again, you the know, way the I look at it. the bomb wasn't dropped. So uh, seeing Harry Truman's small brain and not, and total lack of uh, strategic capacity, one bomb was an absolute necessity. I, I Like you, I've read a lot of the history, and I had two uncles that were in Japan uh, uh, for the reconstruction, and they both agreed that, you should have dropped one bomb. They both thought that the second one was a murderous act of uh, an unbelievable unnecessity, right? The, uh, from everything they saw, the first bomb was more than enough. And well, and, that's and, that that's based on the assumption that the Japanese would have immediately recognized that and surrendered, and they didn't. No, no, no. Uh, that's what they're. That's what I'm saying. They were over there. They talked to the to the Japanese, right? Right. So, so their take was that, uh, in fact, had they known we didn't have a third one, uh, they could have easily decided not to surrender. Right. Uh, so keeping keeping that. Dropping only one and asking how many more would you, would you like? Which city shall we go next? What was for, uh, from their viewpoint, you know? And they lived they lived it. They were there. They talked to the Japanese uh, a after the fact, and 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 the the conclusion was that the second one was was totally unnecessary, and uh, they thought Her Harry Truman just was an idiot, which we of course Oppenheimer thought too, right? But um, well, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that is one opinion. Um, 
but then you, I mean, the counter to that is, um, you know, even after the second bomb, um, and the emperor was in the midst of making a decision about whether to surrender, there was, I mean, he, he the military tried to kill him. Right. So, so he I couldn't mean, surrender. right. Yeah. I mean, that, that it, and again, I'm not tr trying to yeah, say that no, what, what you're, uh, you're right. It, it's uh, just, it right. was, what I'm saying is that nobody, nobody knew. And ultimately, and then, it became a numbers game. Do you want to kill right. 70,000, 80,000 Japanese, or do you want to kill 10 million of them? Do you but want what to... I'm saying, Paul, is Harry Truman was a not very bright blue either or person. Right. And it just, and it just, I mean, it never occurred to him that you only dropped one and then you went back and asked and, and didn't tell them you only had one more, right? Right. And asked which city, which city shall I take next, right? Uh, and, and that would have been uh, probably a Roosevelt strategy, right? It would have been a, uh, could have been. But yeah, it uh, would have been a Churchill strategy, right? But Truman is <laughs> was never a very bright, competent person. You know, the other thing about Oppenheimer that, and, and our problem now is that, you know, but between the bombs and the Cold War, I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember ducking under desks uh, to protect you from an atomic bomb. <laughs> you know, like, what? absolute moron thought that up but so nuclear power became a problem right and mm -hmm. and right now we wouldn't have a problem with carbon uh if we had gone ahead and uh and developed nuclear power i mean it's it's the obvious answer for uh a lot of the grid it uh but uh you know the the whole nuclear bomb side of scaring people to death uh, ha has resulted in no sanity on the issue. Right. And so if, if you have an issue that, that people cannot sanely think about, uh, you know, then you have the problem of uh, we're, we're building windmills that, that won't uh, keep my lights on at night, let alone the solar power that won't. But even, you know, here the wind dies down at dusk a lot of days, and that's when I need the power. So those sorts of, uh, you know, second and third possibility solutions have been put on the table because uh, there there was this terrified group of, of people that were scared of, of not nuclear bombs, but nuclear power, right? And, you know, we don't teach any kind of math or science. We haven't since the 70s. And, and so most people have, have no clue how, how easy it would be to, uh, you know, turn a nuclear power plant in, into a bomb, right? So it's, it's and, and that's a legacy of, of, uh, of the uh, bombs, right? It, it's, and of the Cold War. Not not being able to uh, sanely evaluate nuclear power versus some of the other clean options. Well, I think, I, I think the 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 whole energy movement is grappling with all of that right now. But I think you're right, Barb, in the sense that it colored people's attitudes about uh, nuclear technology in general. I mean, you know, I mean, we've powered our submarines and aircraft carriers with nukes for the last forty years very safely it has not been a major yeah major... i mean you're not afraid of them at all right i i worked with yeah. both nuclear and coal and i will tell you that the coal had de definitely fr from the uh pollution uh has harmed a lot more people than all all total of mm -hmm. the nuclear accidents which may be the exception of chernobyl mm -hmm. and the french have been using nuclear as the primary uh, energy source for their grids for many many decades I mean, I think 90% they export their energy because of the generation. I visited a couple of French uh, nuclear plants when I was in school. And, um, you know, so it's very much a proven technology. But you're right. I think the attitudes, especially after the Fukushima thing, everyone backed off again. For a while, right before uh, Fukushima, uh, there was a real bull market in uranium. A couple of my buddies made a lot of money on the stock market because uranium was taken off. Then Fukushima hit, and then everybody backed off again uh, you know, with that 100-year tsunami. 
So it is a real, it's a, a very um, convoluted uh, set of complexities there, you know, but, but I think both uh, the, uh, you know, whatever we're going to do in energy, uh, nuclear is going to have to figure into the solution there uh, in, in my head, you know. It just gives me an idea for, I'm clearly, I'm, I may have to do a, a talk on nuclear stuff because there's definitely some, some stuff that's being left out of the conversation. But regardless, what I was thinking would be interesting would also be to do a salon on integral war, <laughs> right? Like war, what would say is an integral government? And clearly if you're dealing with other integral governments, I don't know, I think integral people can be horrible too, but that would have to be a discussion. So what is involved, I think it would be akin to the conversation around Japan and, well, do we need to do this? Do we, you know, what if we don't do this? A green perspective would be what? Never drop a bomb on anyone for any reasons. And I would say probably 99.9% .9 of the time, that's probably correct. But what about that 0.1% of the time? What about the repercussions of not doing anything. It's its definitely, as soon as I stop just thinking in pure green, my world has definitely become a lot more complicated and I'm still very sympathetic to, like I said, I tabled at an event where we were making those cranes, which is that tradition in Japanese culture of if you make a thousand cranes, you can save somebody's life or something like that. And uh, so having sympathy for that view and then not just dismissing it and and all that, but it is, is a lot more complex. But I think prior to that, Claire's point about, I mean, I agree with Daryl in that nuclear war has basically become a very back burner issue, but I do think the Ukraine situation has brought it back into the, the focus a bit more because there have literally been mentions of nuclear arms by Russian leader, right? Like he, they're talking about it. So that's fucking scary. <laughs> right. Well, and the extra dimension that's going on now is that, I mean, issues of communism versus capitalism versus her democracy, you know, all of those Cold War issues aside, it was blue, a blue form of government against a, a, a blue form of government. I mean, there was. There was that collective element. It wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just Khrushchev and Kennedy. It was Kennedy and the whole governmental structure under him, and it was Khrushchev and the whole governmental structure under him. And that brought a, a sense of stability. And it, quite frankly, is probably the major contributing factor to why mutually assured destruction worked. Um, to me, I think the, the big thing that's going on now is that um, Putin is not a, I mean, you can argue to the nth degree that Putin is blue. Yeah, he has traditional values, but from his, his leadership style, his way that he views ruling the government, he's, he's, he's ruby red. I mean, he's pure red. I mean, it's him and nothing else and whatever he wants happens. And that's, yeah. Yeah, that's would, a new, that's a new factor that we're trying to wrestle with. I, I would say his, uh, I would say it, it, I I agree in principle. I would just I would just nuance it a bit, Paul, and say I think there is a very definite orange element to Putin's way of thinking. But yes. it, is in, it is informed yes. by a good strong line directly to his red. So they he went through the blue to bring some stability to the to the new Russian Federation, whatever they call themselves now. And that blue was just a touchstone because he really, you're right, resonates red, but he had to manifest that red in a very orange way, in, in right. my way of thinking. So when when you use the term <clears throat> postmodern, remind me, you guys, I can't quite put my finger on it. Is postmodern exiting green or is postmodern equivalent to exiting orange? I'm not sure what it is. What, what, what's, the, what's the hit on postmodern problems, I'm saying? Because when it was mentioned earlier that you know, this plastic doll world has come upon a reality today. And you look and think about how young people are looking at themselves and their images on Instagram or on TikTok and going about like, I think it was Josh said earlier, somebody actually, the, he thought the actress 
actually fixed her face up to be more Barbie-like. So the idea about this plastic reality, which I had a friend come back from uh, uh, back east. I think he's in Virginia or somewhere. Anyway, he came to California. And he and his wife, he said they marveled at how many beach blondes they saw that they knew were not real blondes. And I never even think about this living in Southern California. But for him, it was a stark contrast to what he understands people actually really look like. Where he said in California, you got a lot of, you know, he didn't say Barbies, but pretty much when he said beach blondes, I thought Barbie, you know. And so so you have that reality. Is that a postmodern manifested problem? And, and so where is postmodern? Is postmodern orange to green or is postmodern green to yellow? I mean, what, what's your guys' thoughts on that? Steve, weigh in. Uh, yeah, so I weigh in. So I would say it's orange to green because I think it's it's about, it's, it's I mean, it, there's lots of things obviously to say about postmodernism, but one of the things philosophically is it gets beyond the idea of essence in a way. It says that there's only kind of, you know, one of their classic things is there is only the text, that there's no truth context. to the authorial, me author you know, the author's meaning or intention or, you know, and so, and that they got very inspired by being in the age of reproduction. So, you know, when you can have a million copies, exact copies of a given artwork, what, what's the value of the original? And, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are lots of other themes like that that they delve into. And so appearance becomes kind of all that there is. But then in, in the, in the sort of spiral dynamics term, green has has a lot of meanings beyond that. And I think when people say green is postmodern, they kind of more are talking about post so-called postmodern social justice activism and that type of stuff, which is then all of this kind of critical race theory then applied to politics. Um, so it's it's quite a tortured, convoluted kind of trail, and I'm not sure how much value it's you know it's kind of if you like theory it's a kind of interesting trail but I, I don't know that it really leads anywhere and i think that's why people end up being so down on the whole green meme if you know what I mean, because it's a kind of you get to this and you know and, and i think the greens are often accused of virtue signaling and if you look at it closely it, it, it kind of that's really what a lot of it amounts to it's kind of but josh often says that it's uh you know um at least I, I don't want to put words into your mouth josh but it seems to me like you're you you've said before that a lot of people in the green camp are you know more concerned to be seen to be green than to actually be solving yeah. the problem so you know um is that roughly fair fair characterization josh is that um yeah but um but the, the reason the reason I put my hand up is because I just wanted to, if you don't mind me asking, I, I just want to come back to the the, the okay. point I raised at the Steve, beginning. Before you do that, I just want to do a quick thing on postmodernism. Mm -hmm. I uh, from from a scientific viewpoint of uh, you know I, when I was at Caltech, I worked with a few folks who knew Oppenheimer well, uh, and um, the take there is that postmodernism is a misinterpretation of of uh, quantum physics and relativity in in other words the the way mm. we as scientists understand it uh it has been taken over by not too bright greens who who uh can't do math or science at all they were never taught it and weren't interested in it mm. and you know so so things like the whole is is greater than the sum of the parts actually uh the truth is the whole is 99.9% .9 less than the sum of the parts. You put things together and mostly it's catastrophic failure. Uh, and, and so it's those sorts of misinterpretations, right? And I think it ran, it actually ran green down uh, a lot of rabbit holes, right? I mean, it's, it sounds really good to say that there's no right answer. And, and I think most scientists would agree with that. There, there's several uh, things that could work. But that, but then to take the uh, opposite tact is that there's no wrong answer. You know, it, it's not true. Ninety nine percent of the things that that woke green and postmodernism proposes are catastrophic failure modes. Right. And and so therein lies the problem. It's it's ran green very quickly into into some very toxic uh, methodologies and and maybe prevented. Uh, healthy green from emerging. You know, the, to, to me, the and I 
dove pretty deeply into metamodernism a while back to put to try to come up with a better understanding of it. And the 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 best analogy that I ever came up with is think of it as two concentric circles. Um, and green and metamodernism. And and oftentimes how it's viewed and talked about it is it's like this. It's, you know, there's, you know, 95%, they, they share 95% of the space together. And my sense is the reality is it's more like this. You know, yes, there are green elements of, of metamodern, there are elements of metamodernism in green, but there's a whole lot more to green than metamodernism. And the same can be said, yeah, there are green elements in metamodernism, but there's a whole lot more to metamodernism than green. So it's, if you're looking for a, a, an, an image, um, that's how I kind of ultimately came to at least separate out to me that, and I don't disagree the fact that much, much of the discussion virtually totally equates green with metamodernism. And I think it does a disservice to both. So, so Paul, explain in your mind the difference between postmodernism and metamodernism. Well, okay, metamodernism again, uh, and this is just this is just my understanding. Um, metamodernism is is it is a an attempt to bridge the gap between modernism and postmodernism. Does that, Steve, does that? Yeah, it's often framed as what comes after postmodernism. That's how it yeah. often frames itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and again, I, who the hell knows what, you know, I mean, I couldn't explain what traditionalism is, you know, if you want to get down into the weeds. <laughs> but yeah, it, because metamodernism is post postmodernism. Um, and I've never heard of a post 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 postmodernism yet, but, <laughs> but, and 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 then, but what? How it's framed is that usually it's that okay. You had a you had a dominant worldview of modernism, and and you had a a dominant worldview of of, of postmodernism, and there are elements of truth and elements of untruth in both of them, and metamodernism is an attempt to kind of meld the truths, you know separate the seed from the chaff if you will of both truths is that mm -hmm. is that yeah i mean there's different takes on it but i, th I think i mean one one of them is that they think that, that so, so the, it, broadly they see postmodernism as part of modernity they see, sort of see it as the end chapter of modernity and they say they, they see metamodernity as kind of coming next and it draws on things from different places like integral theory spiral dynamics but other things as, as well and and they're sort of saying, well, where does society go after postmodernism? Because postmodernism seemed like a kind of dead end. It seemed like a sort of end of the road where everything's relative. There's no real meaning. There's no grand narrative or anything. But they were saying, but people need people need big stories. You know, whether they're true or not, people need big stories. So where where do you go from here? And so what they're trying to do is 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 in some way salvage the best parts of of modernism. And even pre-modern things as well, you know, so the yes. sense that spirituality will rise up, even sense of magic, you know, almost like the whole. So it's quite spiral dynamics in that sense that they're kind of moving second. It's kind of moving second tier, really. I think if you put it in a spiral dynamics term, and I, and I, and I think people from the integral or, or spiral dynamics community in the meta modern world would think of it at the moment as a kind of a yellow verging on yellow, trying to reach for turquoise or something like that. Um, uh, you know, it's still very, very theoretical and, and philosophical, um, but they're, they're trying to they're trying to kind of work out how you could draw on the whole sort of meme stack, you know, from 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 purple up to up to green or whatever, um, and come up with a whole new world view. And um, so, so they will say things like, well, you know, grand narratives are back. You can tell big stories now. But they combine that at the same time with the, this idea that they call um, ironic sincerity. So it's the idea that you can really believe something like a religion, but not need it to be true in a, in a kind of objective scientific sense. 
so which is it's a very it's a very interesting way <laughs> idea you know so that that's kind of how they get beyond the 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 the, the postmodern sort of everything's just made up and you know it's just a story and whatever you know which tended to be a bit kind of nihilistic so they're saying well no if if it's working for you then it still is valuable even if it's not sort of objectively or publicly true if you see what i mean so it's a, it's quite an interesting space i think at the moment it's still too theoretical it's still too yellow and it's not you know the tire hasn't tires haven't really hit the road yet so there's lots of people coming out with lots and lots of theories and ideas and perspectives so Steve, that are, you, you've met uh, ironic sincerity can you can you stay with that is again it's a fascinating concept yeah it's very it's very fascinating so it's so <laughs> it, it's the idea of sort of that people need to believe they need to believe in something basically so it's a recognition of that fact and the ir ironic Harari type stuff, right say again harari type belief harari types yeah and it's like people need to believe in something and it, interestingly though the, the the there was an american philosophical movement in the late 1800s called pragmatism that came up with almost exactly the same kind of thing that you you need to you know you need to believe and you rarely have enough evidence to believe the things you want to believe to get on with your life. So, so it's interesting because I can I connect that. Sorry to interrupt you. I connect that yeah, with, Josh's, it, yeah. with Josh's term of uh, virtual signaling. I, I kind of connect those two things as I yeah. know. Yeah, but I think I think this is more. Um, it's it's less. It's probably less social. So the virtual signaling would be trying to just tell other people you're a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, in the in the agreed sort of this is the code for what counts as good right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And don't don't necessarily believe it at all. I don't necessarily believe it. This is more like, OK, well, you know, I, I want to believe that Jesus was a magician who came to the UK and, you know, did various things in Glastonbury. And that's a really, really important belief for me. You know, I, I don't know. And, and I don't need it to be true in a way. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So it's a mm -hmm. sort of it's kind of getting beyond the need for your beliefs or your grand story to be kind of publicly true, uh, which is it's then myth, kind of leading towards building. the esoteric, really. It's kind of, uh, but it's quite, it's quite liberating because it says, you know, go, go have your story, you know, have your, have your, make sense of the world, however you can make sense of it. And the, the measure more is, I think, is more, is, is it working for you? Does that work for you? You know? Mm. Yeah. The fact that it's grounded in reality does not matter, apparently, right? Well, I, well, uh, well I think, it I never think... has to humans, right, <laughs> Daryl? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you if you read Harari, yeah. uh, and I think I find him very compelling. Um, civilization is not built on truths; it's it's built on uh, grand narratives, and they work better the more likely the, the less likely they are to be true. Yeah. Well, and the other element of metamodernism. <clears throat> Is a is a, a balance between the subjective and the objective, you know, in in the extreme. And I realize this is in the extreme. One could say, um, orange is all about objective, the objective. And in the extreme, you could say, um, green is all about the subjective. And the truth is, both exist. Both are incredibly important and somehow you have to blend the two and find a whole lot of lines in there to say okay yeah i subjectively believe this i know objectively it's not true but i can still believe it but i can't believe the next thing that comes along because that takes me too one step too far away from the the objective that i that it's going to be dangerous to me if you will so it's just another way of looking looking at the how do you how do you when you put either when you it's another way of looking at metamodernism yeah it's another way of right. framing they, they, they don't want to throw science um, out with the bathroom, society, so it's not... Paul, what's uh, that and i have a quick question for steve um mm -hmm. steve as so you were talking about that people can sort of choose their narrative but is it now with a consciousness that it may not be real is it like a conscious or is it still unconscious it's it's kind of conscious so it's so you know 
that you don't have a, 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 a public reality for it, if you like. That's the kind of ironic aspect. Do you so have a, a good knowing, example? It's a sort of knowing. So it's like you're kind of, it's, I think it's linked to this idea of play. Um, but but you're at the same time, so, you know, so, so you know it's not real in the kind of scientific sense. But at the same time, you can invest in it because it kind of works for you, if, if you see what I mean. So it's kind, kind uh, of real, <laughs> kind of real. So, okay. So uh, because I, sometimes I hang out in sort of meta modern spheres and I know that having a sense of humor is important, which it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and having a, a sense of irony, a, a very kind of playful sense of irony. Um, so I don't know. Anyway, I, I think we should invite somebody to come delve into metamodernism for us a little bit more because it's it's fascinating because it does mm -hmm. I, I mentioned in the chat that for, from what I understand it and the equivalency charts of developmental levels that I think metamodernism is usually equated to yellow and yet it, as you were explaining Steve it seems to have its own flavor that's different from the from the idea of second tier maybe and I it's definitely something I've been wanting to understand better so you know, that's, that would be really good. Steve, a while back, Steve and I tried to undertake a <laughs> a thing of co-developing a presentation on metamodernism. And I put together a set of slides. And unfortunately, it, 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 it hit Steve at a time when he was like, really, really, his life was outside of spiral dynamics was ramping up. Um, but also, at least from my perspective, it was it was like going down a damn rabbit hole. I mean, it was. I think I struggled to keep it to about forty or so slides. I mean, you could, if if you wanted to treat it, it would be at least five hundred slides. I think it would be interesting to have, well, I always love the way you break things down, Paul, because you have a really nice way of analyzing things and then sharing the material. But at the same time, it would be really fun to have someone from the metamodern world come in. Yeah. And it's funny how I tend to want to say a metamodern guy in the sense of a, a male, because most of the people that hang out in men modern circles, I don't know if I'm mistaken. There are definitely women, but it seems very male. Maybe that's just because it's the sphere that I know on the internet. There seem to be a lot of men. That's right, but the, but some of the more interesting people are women, I think. <laughs> so that's the as as is often the case. In the oh world. yeah, that's, Steve. Uh, yeah, yeah. So no, I mean like Bonnie Roy, I find her one of the. I mean, she's, she. I don't even know if she'd call herself strictly metamodern, but she's one of the most interesting people in that in that whole world. I think she's. Um, mm. Yeah. Sounds like that's going to be the next uh, salon topic, I guess. Yeah. Well, Did we lose David, by the way? Yeah, he he had to go. Yeah, he had another commitment. He said. Yeah, he asked me if it was a, a, about about hosting, and I said, "Well, yeah, I I can I'm I am I'm can host I can host. Please leave whenever you want." And I thanked him for the presentation. Yeah. So it was a good. I mean, it was. I thought I don't want to circle back and totally treat it, but. I thought it was a good presentation. I oh, think it was nice. a good discussion. And he did, I mean, it did, it does lead very much into this whole discussion of metamodernism. Mm -hmm. Because, because again, the, you know, you've got, I mean, in this case, it's a blue versus orange world, but it's again, it's a subjective versus objective you know, big, big issues in that. And that's what metamodernism is about. I mean, it's just yeah. the, 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 the existential nature of it is ratcheted up even more, you know, now, now we, you know, we don't, we don't have the luxury of just dealing with nuclear Holocaust. We have, we have nuclear Holocaust. We have biological Holocaust. We have, um, we have environmental Holocaust. We got to deal with all of these. <laughs> And they're very well, Paul, you implied when when you talked about it, uh, you know, you said something about you can you can go down the uh, rabbit hole of your belief and until the then sort of the next step becomes dangerous. 
and I took that to mean in the physical world, but I think one of the things that's happened with with the uh, both blue and green on the communitarian side is that uh, it becomes even more dangerous in the social world these days to uh, to, to uh, have a belief that doesn't agree with with uh, the main uh, trends in in your circles. Oh, and, I would. And, and and so that that's perhaps uh, a, a big deal as well. Oh, I would 100% agree with you on that, Barb. And, and I guess when I when I chose the word rabbit hole, I was yes, I was thinking about how how ultimately something can get you someplace. But to me, it was the you know, and I I, I appreciate Veronica's comment about me and I do tend to do that I do try I do try to break the things up and present it in a good way and I I haven't gone back and looked at it but it was about it had to have been about 40 slides mm -hmm. and it's like it was exhausting and it was like okay I need at least another 100 150 slides <laughs> <laughs> it was a fucking rabbit hole <laughs> Can I just ask the question I, was, I, I put my hand up for originally which was just um the one thing that really strikes me about the Barbie is it, it's, you know, it's trying to kind of shift society, I think, but it's trying to do it to a really mainstream audience. And that's one thing that really, really struck me about the film. It's like, you know, I've seen loads and loads of art house films, that are, but they're only talking to a tiny little slice of society who are already either there or hate it or whatever, you know, so it's like, whereas this is really, really trying to reach the mainstream. It's trying to meet, I think in its own mind, it's trying to reach people who are stuck in blue or orange and saying there's a whole you know there's a whole green or yellow world up here guys come and come and join us you know and, i mean and, and we often in this group talk about the, the frustrations of okay well how do we take our yellowish perspectives and, and make them real and make them do something in the world but this this to me seemed like something that could actually really open people's eyes or shift their opinions so i'd, I'd just be interested if anyone had any perspective on that or any any thoughts around that well, that's, you know, that's a really interesting comment, Steve, because, again, I, I did not see the movie, so I don't want to speak too deeply. But I guess the thing that struck me as I listened to, as a narrative on it unfolded, I mean, a couple things struck me about, you know, I'm assuming that how people describe the movie is what happened. The first thing, and I hadn't realized that, that the structure of it was, it started out in Barbie world, and then Barbie went into real world. I didn't. I hadn't grokked that yet, but you know, let's, let's just call Barbie world something different. It's hyper matriarchy. Mm. I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's women have everything, men have nothing. Mm. And it, so that's where it started. Well then, so that's like, I mean, I can see why, why the, the conservatives are like, <laughs> um, but then she goes into um, real world and, and takes Ken with her. And then he discovers, hey, this, is, this isn't a matriarchy. This is a patriarchy. And this, this, this works at some level too. Uh, and it especially works for people like me. I'm a guy, I'm a, I'm a patriarch. <laughs> um, so he then takes it back and, and starts to duplicate the patriarchy. Which, you know, again, if you want to apply that to them, to what's going on now, uh, we've lived in a patriarchy for a long time. And the matriarchy is is beginning a, a process that to at the very least reassert itself and say it's relevant. And and I guess the ultimate end, again, how I understand how the movie ended is that, you know, Ken didn't necessarily you know, bring about a new era of of total patriarchy, it came more to a balance. And so that was, I mean, I thought that's a pretty cool message and that could be very, could be very impactful. Because that's where, hopefully that's where humanity is heading. That's where our reality is heading. You know, more, you know, a balance at some point. I mean, that's what, that's what spiral dynamics says. That's what integral is all about. It's it's coming up with a balance. Daryl. No, it made, made it, you know just reminded me of, of something I'm observing 
right or wrong or indifferent is that uh, there's a lot of uh, movies uh, out or shows out where the herons are like at the forefront. For instance, I watched the series uh, Westworld and it's interesting in that the, the real heroes of this movie were all women, all the power players were all women. And I see that as a trend, which I think is a, in a largest scale or acknowledging women and and the feminine power, regardless of, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying sexuality, or anything like that. It's just that there are now an acknowledgement of in the, in the um, entertainment world anyway, of, of a new kind of way of seeing power players. And if you, if you're familiar with Westworld, the the main well not all the the main villains were men actually, but the more powerful players were all women. I just think that's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, I just wanted to see if we wanted to come up. Well, first of all, I think we should turn off the recording. But do we want to figure out next week since we get to the end of the session? And we're like, oh shit, what?